Hi again everyone. So this is part two of the explorers or boys messing about uh, language and structure analysis video from me. And the first thing to mention is that this is the second time I'm recording this bit. So apologies if it doesn't sound as enthusiastic as it could. I've already done this once today, didn't save for some reason. Um, and so you can see these are all my annotations that I've already done. So instead of writing them all out again, um, more for my memory really, I'm just going to leave them here and I'm going to talk you through each one. And I'm just going to highlight to you uh, where I am really at each point, just using this pink highlighter. I'll put a little dot next to where, or I'll change the colour of this rather, so you know which bit I'm talking about uh, and where I'm up to. So the first thing to mention is just this detail about where he's also known as Q, um, which is here, obviously. I'll highlight it here. I don't think my Apple Pencil's working. Give me one moment. There we go. Um, so also known as Q. Now Q, you may know, is the name of a character in James Bond films who is the technical expert. So the fact that this Mr. Smith is known as Q, he might be one of those people who, you know, tells people what their nickname should be. Um, that just makes them him appear even more ridiculous because he claims to be this technological expert, this James Bond figure, and yet they've ended up having to be rescued by all these different people after getting themselves into such a mess. Um, now, the last thing I talked about was how they're presented as foolish. We've got the emergency people, as I mentioned. We've got the uh, expensive watch, which makes them feel like they are... Um, professional adventurers but really they're just privileged rich men and they are juxtaposed continually so I'm just onto this bit now they are juxtaposed uh, continually against the professional um, military peep figures who come and rescue them so where they were uh, ditched where they were plucked um, and where they were plunged and where their mission, so to speak, ended in farce, that's juxtaposed against the really professional actions of the Coast Guards and all the different um, organisations that have helped them. So we see that in the use of language. Uh, the signals were deciphered, uh, which, it, which sounds professional, it sounds difficult, it sounds like they're using expertise in order to do that. Um, secondly, uh, they were surveying um, the Royal Navy, 180 miles away, which is a very long way away. It's like they are an inconvenience. They are a nuisance. Um, they've taken them, they've taken these professional people off course and they have distracted them from their original plan and their original mission just for some foolish um, mistake. Um, surveying once again suggests care and suggests expertise. They had to begin steaming towards the scene. So they had to move really quickly and really purposefully in order to rescue them. And the other use of language, they dispatched. So, so they didn't just send, but that dispatched is like official military language, which once again presents the military as much more professional, much more experienced much more prepared for these situations than these two men. So we have, as I said, that juxtaposition working between the two things. And we've got the two Lynx helicopters. Now, I don't know too much about helicopters, but that's in juxtaposition to their helicopter with one, where was it, their single engine, quite small helicopter, which wasn't fit for this mission. They dispatch the proper helicopters, the two Lynx helicopters, which makes them appear even more foolish. So the military are equipped. They're using appropriate um, equipment and vehicles. And that's juxtaposed against the single engine helicopter in order to um, make them appear inferior and ill prepared. OK, the next things I've highlight highlighted are the 
structurally, the writer brings in opinions from experts. And this is done once again to contrast and be juxtaposed against the two men who got themselves in this particular situation. So we've got another expert, contrast to the explorers. He says it's nothing short of a miracle um, that they had survived. And that word survived is uh, structured at the end of the paragraph. So it gives us a moment to reflect on it and emphasises it. This reminds us of the severity. I'll write that word out again as it's not very clear. Severity, the seriousness of the situation they got themselves in. It heightens how naive they were. Now, what we have in the last paragraph on this first page is a shift in tone. So that is, of course, again, another structure technique, SF structure. Um, and we have this section, this three or four paragraphs, where the men are actually presented as quite capable people. They're both experienced adventurers. It signals the shift in tone. This man has negotiated the white water rapids of the Zambezi River. Negotiated suggests that this person has been able to, is quite skilled, and they're quite careful in what they've done. Um, they're also qualified, which suggests they've got some expertise in flying and engineering. Um, now, one use of language that, that casts doubt on the skill of these people is this word here, claims. Now, Mr. Smith claims to have been flying since the age of five. So the writer seems to question whether this person is telling the entire tr truth and whether they're as experienced as they are. Who really learned to fly at the age of five? I don't know anyone who could do that. Um, and he won the World Freestyle Helicopter Flying Championship. So they are experienced. They do know what they're doing. Um, surely they should know better than to do this if they've got all these qualifications. Anyway, we have here the word despite. And that creates a sh another shift in tone. But this time we're going back to the criticism. We're going back to the writer making them appear foolish. Um, we have uh, in this paragraph here, line 48, in April, we have, um, we're, we're being um, guided through the text again. We have another uh, time connective here. And we're given another example, another instance of how naive they were. This isn't the first time they've gone on an ill-advised, a poorly planned trip. They wanted to be the first people to complete a crossing of the 56-mile frozen Bering Strait. Um, but they were forced to stop it, to cause a halt. If you cause a halt to something, you don't just stop, but you have to stop it immediately. And you have to stop quickly which suggests, um, once again, how ill-prepared um, they were. Um, so the next paragraph, um, we learn how these people wanted to do this mission between the U US and Russia because they wanted to prove how good relations between the East and West had become. Now... Imagine this. These two men want to demonstrate, they want to prove how united Russia and the United States, Britain, are. So after 40, 50, 60 years of suspicion, of spying, of poisoning, they think they are the two men that are going to unite these two conflicting nations that were embroiled in the Cold War. The words that I wrote were, it presents these men as delusional egotistical. They are presented as very self-important. Uh, they think they have this great self-importance. They think they are, they have this, this grand aim that's way above their station. Now, structurally, this grand aim, this great idea they have, is undercut, that says. Not what you, not what a, a gent might have done on his hair, but it's, it's undercut by what happened afterwards it is undermined so you've got something serious like this but instantly that is undermined so immediately structurally the writer follows up with an expert that makes them appear inept so initially they have this grand aim 
but straight away it makes them appear really foolish to have this grand aim because we're presented with an expert opinion that makes them sound silly for having a go at doing that. This person, this expert, um, Gunter uh, Endres, who's an editor of Jane's Helicopter Markets and Systems, so he knows what he's talking about, says um, they were pushing it to the maximum with this helicopter. So that suggests, the, the verb pushing suggests they're naive, they're foolish, they're inexperienced, they're taking risks, and they are reckless. Uh, they are pushing something that's not ready, that's not equipped to do that. So they're being very reckless and not being careful with pushing that helicopter too far. You'll see here we have repetition of experts questioning them. We saw that phrase on the first page. The wisdom of the team's latest adventure was questioned by. That repetition of the, of the word wisdom suggests that it's, it heightens and emphasises their lack of wisdom. The more their wisdom is questioned, the less wise these two men are appearing. Then the next paragraph, line 60, the writer says they have a spokesman. Now, a spokesman, rather than speaking for themselves, also makes them appear really privileged, grand, important. But this has the opposite effect. This doesn't make me think that they are important. It makes them appear even more foolish. And that's because they say they did not even know what had gone wrong. They don't even have the expertise to reflect on what had happened. The flying conditions had been excellent. They say it wasn't their fault. The flying conditions were excellent. I think that makes them look even more foolish because even in excellent conditions, they couldn't make their mission successful. So that word there, that inclusion of the direct quotation excellent, uses their own words against them and makes them appear even more foolish. Next paragraph. The Minister of Defence said the taxpayer would pick up the bill. Now, I think this is a structure point. I think the writer, imagine they're sitting in the Guardian London office at King's Cross. They're writing this article to go in the paper the next day. They think, now, where am I going to include the fact the taxpayer has, will foot the bill? Well, I want to really emphasise that it's the taxpayer who will have to make up for these people's mistakes and pay up to £100,000, a waste of money, frankly, because these people had ideas above their station thought they were in a new Indiana Jones movie and then undertook this great mission. So it leaves, so the writer puts it in the title, the reference to the taxpayer, and they leave it until the end for the most emphasis. So once we've, after we've learned all the details of the story, then they tell us, and it makes us more angry. Look, I was so angry that my handwriting became even worse than usual there. Um, and the spokesperson said, for the Ministry of Defence this time, it was highly unlikely. So that heightens and emphasises just how reckless these people were and how much of a waste uh, this mission was, what a waste of money it was. And then the last thing we learn is a quotation from their wife. And whenever a, 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 when all the last sentences we have in these extracts, they always emphasise something. They're the last sentence for a reason. That's the last thing the writer wants us to remember about this story. They purposefully include this humorous quotation last. The wife of one of the explorers, or explorers in inverted commas, says they'll probably have their bottoms kicked and be sent the home the long way. Now, this just makes... Um, the explorers be presented as naughty children. They are presented not as serious men, but they're presented as juvenile, infantile, immature. So structurally, the writer ends the article by reinforcing the message and the idea that these men are all of these things, that they are immature and they're not careful enough and they're not taking uh, their, their decisions seriously enough. So that's the second half. Now, you'll probably, if you're asked to write about this text for question four on the examination, you'll probably be asked to consider the right, how the writer presents their thoughts and feelings about the explorers. Or you might be asked to, to explain 
how the writer has presented the explorers. If you have the latter, how the writer has presented the explorers, then here are some words I want you to make sure you've got written down. Lots of them I've obviously already used in my explanation of the article, but these men are presented as foolish, and you could easily pick out two or three quotations to prove that. They are naive, they are inept, they are juvenile, they're childish, they're immature, they're careless, they're inexperienced, they're reckless, they're dangerous. Furthermore, they are selfish. They've put themselves at risk, almost caused a tragedy, and then they've got all these different military outfits to have to help them. They are privileged, they're wealthy, they've got a spokesman, and they went helicoptering for three months, and they've got this expensive watch. They are wasteful of public resources. They are delusional. They think they are these adventure heroes, when actually they're too inexperienced in the grand scheme of things explorers they are egotistical in their aims they think they can show how russia and the west have been united when that's not the case um, the writer's feelings this writer is angry towards these men he is biased against them there's a sense of frustration that the taxpayer will have to pay for this adventure but it's not always serious the writer presents them in a comical way. We see that at the end, where they're naughty school children, having their bottoms kicked, for example. Um, the writer pokes fun at them by questioning their wisdom, by using phrases like plucked and plunged. And the writer basically is mocking these men, sometimes even using their own words against them there. Okay, folks, so there's part two, um, the second time around for me, of this video um, series on um, explorers or boys messing about. I hope that makes sense. Again, it's not the most descriptive and interesting language and structure-wise of texts that we've uh, looked at. But as you can see, there's lots of these little words that we can really zoom in on and comment on. And there's some really good structure techniques in terms of how the writer has ordered the text and also in terms of how the writer has guided us through it with their time adverbials, with their connectives, and also how they've uh, decided what um, information to leave to the end. That has an additional impact on the reader as well. So well done for following that along. Hopefully you've got really good annotations for that. Hope it makes sense. And I'll um, be seeing uh, hopefully some of you next week for uh, a 